uh, or how we're setting our title volume and how we are setting our PEEP and FIO2 uh, according to a table. So that's why the team is so, so important that we're saying we're using APRB, but the TCAV method. And because if, as you read articles out there, I really uh, hope you pay attention to the methods. Because if someone says, well, APRB uh, did this and the conclusion is this, pay attention to the method they were using. Were they using the TCAV method? Um, because all the results, everything we've talked about here at ICON, you guys have heard Jeff Lear talk about, Dr. Herbashi and Penny Andrews is all using the TCAV method and that's how they get the results. So time constant adaptive ventilation. It's P high setting it at the plateau pressure. T high is typically set at 90% of the, our total cycle time. And we'll talk about that, how it's a little different with our rescue patients. P low is always set to zero to minimize expiratory resistance and maximize ventilation. We'll go through that. And then T low is based on lung mechanics by analyzing the slope and the expiratory flow curve. And I think this is a huge advantage. We're actually setting and creating P based on what the patient needs. Uh, we're getting a, a little peek of what they need looking at the expiratory flow patterns versus using a table to tell us where to set our P. So P high, so it's long. So you see APRV, it's a long inspiratory time with short releases. You know, we all know what CPAP is. And CPAP is a, basically a patient uh, just breathing in continuous positive every pressure. We know what they're comfortable on it because they go home on that. And that so that's CPAP, right? When we add releases, it's basically APRV. So high, a high CPAP level, high PEEP level with releases to augment CO2. So when should we use APRV? So when when do you guys wear seatbelts, right? We always wear seatbelts in the car just in case we get into a car accident. Well, why not use APRV at least on those we know they're going to be high risk patients or trauma patients or septic patients. Uh, there are attendings out there that have practiced at University of Maryland shock trauma that automatically put it on their traumatic brain injury patients to protect the lungs. Uh, a hospital that I've recently been to automatically puts it on their VA ECMO patients, they have nothing, lung issues, but to protect the lung. Two, you should also use it. If you're using it at a rescue, know your patients. You know, is this an ARDS patient? Do they have atelectasis? You know, is this a patient that has recruitable lung versus non-recruitable lung? Because, and so we know what our goal is with these patients. We should know our uh, patient's compliance. Uh, do they have low compliance because of uh, abdominal compartment syndrome, obese, you know, or the obese patients? So. It's important what to, to know our goal with our, our with these patients. So P high. So another thing we really emphasize is, especially here at ICON too, when we get calls, we always ask a, certain questions about your patients. And that's what you should be thinking too before you transition to someone to APRV. So the, the first concern is, what is your patient preload dependent? So because in APRV, as we'll go through, our mean airway pressure is usually based two to three below our uh, below our P high. So we achieve a higher mean airway pressure without really cranking up that plateau pressure as you would need in other modes. But the higher mean you're creating, if someone's intravascularly dry, you're going to see uh, some issues uh, hemodynamically with these patients. So I always suggest, you know, know your patient. It, you know, you can talk to your provider before we switch a patient to APRV is try increasing your PEEP. If you increase your PEEP and you see the mean blood pressure decrease by 10%, that's a sign they're, they're, they're um, intravascularly dry. Uh, other maneuvers you can do is passive uh, leg raise, liver compression, put the patient in T-Berg. And I, I want to run through the uh, passive leg raise. So any of these maneuvers, you're not stimulating the patient in any other way. So patients that are not really awake and uh, trauma, strike trauma, this is a, a common method done where we're actually, uh, the patient's in the semi-recumbent position. We drop the head of bed to the flat and raise both of their legs as long as there's no contraindications. And you're basically giving them now a fluid bolus. So any of those maneuvers, uh, passive leg raise, liver compression, those are going to now, uh, you, should, you should see an increase in their mean blood pressure. So me, by raising their patient doing a passive leg raise, you're basically giving almost a 500 cc bolus, let's say. So if you see mean blood pressure increase, 
again, they reacted to your, your fluid. So things to think about um, as you're transitioning to patients to APRV, uh, especially you don't want a patient to crash when you put them on APRV. So this is a question, and this is this is the look I get a lot of times uh, when when I was at the hospital from some of our newer grads. I would say, how did your patient do on APRV? They give me this puzzle look uh, because they would say, well, they didn't tolerate it. And then I would ask, why didn't they tolerate? What happened? So they would say, well, the SAT dropped. Okay. Did anything else change besides the SAT dropped? How did the patient react hemodynamically is my question. Um, and, and I, I, you know, I guess as new grads, we panic when we see, uh, or someone using the mode for the first time, we panic when we see the SAT drop. So we go back to the previous mode. So I want you to guys think of this. If you had a patient with a, a lot of atelectasis, wasn't seeing any gas exchange, and now you're opening them up, now they're seeing uh, actually gas exchange for the first time, yeah, their SATs will drop initially. Just be patient. Wait at the bedside. Their SATs will go back up. Just give it time. If you see blood pressure drop, then that's a different story. Then again, is this patient intravascular dry? So that's why it's so important to assess that ahead of time to know your patient. Uh, again, because if you're trying APRV, especially for the first time, and your patient crashes, the physician's like, oh, take them off, it didn't work. So P high. So you wanna see use the same amount of pressure that the lungs were already seeing in your previous mode if you're transitioning a patient over. And remember, I think a one really great advantage in APRV. So the top one, what you're seeing now is our usual um, waveforms in conventional ventilation. Look how much short period of time we're spending in that recruitment zone, your inspiratory time. Look how much time you're spending in the de-recruitment zone, your expiratory time. So APRV, what you're doing, you're actually spending a lot more time in the recruitment zone at that P high. I think that, and that's a huge advantage with just those short releases. So again, where do we see P, set P high? We want to be validating the patient in the steep part of this curve. In traditional modes, you're adding PEEP and you keep increasing PEEP to try to prevent the recruitment, increase mean. But guess what? You're going to have to ventilate above that PEEP level. And then you're at risk of causing lung injury if you're over distending the patient's lung. Our P high, our high CPAP level, we, we could be setting at the same place we feel the patient, the people patient needs, but we are ventilating from releasing from that P high. So again, if we can use the high PEEP, but we don't have to worry about ventilating above them because we ventilate by releasing that high CPAP level, the, the P high. Our goal is to make sure we don't drop them below FRC, and that's the importance of how we're going to set T low, and we'll get to that. So P high. For those that are using using it from the time of intubations, and there are some facilities out there, twenty to twenty four is our usual starting a P high and assess your patient depending on changes you'll need based on oxygenation and ventilation. For those that are transitioning, as most facilities are using AP, uh, APRB as a transition, you want to use the, in a volume mode, the plateau pressure, not the mean area pressure. Again, you have to use the pressure of the lungs that we're already seeing. I've seen those that use mean and it, it won't work. Uh, you're not giving the patient a, a, enough pressure. Um, and then their patients look uncomfortable and very tachypneic. In a pressure mode, you want to use your total pressure in a dual targeted mode as well. So here's an example. We're in volume control, assist control. Um, this is a V500. Uh, Tidal volumes are 450. You see our pips are 33. Our inspiratory uh, plateau pressure, end of inspiratory pressure here is 22. What should our, B, our P high be? And here's our means 8.8. .8. Our P high, um, right, should be, oops, the P high, I'm going backwards. The P high should be our, our, our plateau pressure. Sorry about that. In pressure control, assist control, uh, we said total pressure. So our total pressure on a drager is our P in is 22 or PIP is 22. That should be our P high. Through an example of VC SIMV with auto flow in. 
especially when you're seeing the tidal volume high minimum pressure alarm. Uh, and that's occurring when a patient has a high flow demand, the ventilator thinks their compliance is good. So it's really weaning their inspiratory pressure. And that's why the vents alarming minimum pressure, high tidal volume, you see our PIP of 12. So in these patients, you really need to interpret this and say a P, a P, a P high of 12 is not going to work. Uh, so sometimes turning off auto flow to get a plateau pressure, or then just as you're transitioning, you know, trying to, a, a plateau where you're seeing a good release volume. So those patients are a little trickier. So P low, P low should be set at zero. And I want to say it's P low should be set at zero on ventilators that actually has a, that does not have a T low that's fluctu uh, fluctuating. I have seen uh, ventil certain ventilators that at times will fluctuate the T low and that's the only time we will recommend a P low. Otherwise, a P low should be set at zero uh, to minimize expiratory resistance and encouraging, you know, we're encouraging expiratory fl uh, flow. Don't forget, we're already adding enough uh, resistance to the patient as they are exhaling with the artificial airway and going, you know, breathing through the entire circuit. Does the patient really go down to a pressure of zero? No, they do not. And that's a, a, a common question. So, you can actually assess how much PEEP you're creating. So even though the PLE low is zero, we're not setting PEEP, we're creating PEEP with time low. For patients that are not really spontaneously breathing, you could get an accurate auto, uh, how much PEEP we're creating by doing an expiratory hold, freeze your screen and, and move your cursor to the end of expiration. And that's what I did here. This is pressure over time. This is flow over time. I did a, an expiratory hold anywhere to two to four seconds, move the cursor to the end of expiration. So this is my end expiratory pressure. And in this case, I'm creating a, a PEEP of 28 for this patient. And this also became really important when the uh, Dr. Amato study came out about plateau, uh, driving pressure less than 15 helps decrease mortality. Um, so because a lot of physicians, I actually had a physician that did not want to use APRV because they felt, oh my gosh, you're going for like this example, you're going from 38 to zero that my driving pressure is 38. That's not the case. Your driving pressure in APRV is P high, which is your plateau, minus the auto peep you're creating. So in this case, it's 38 minus 28. My, uh, my auto peep, I mean, my driving pressure is only 10. So I just want to make that sure that's important because I've actually had, had explained that to uh, a few physicians. So again, the driving pressure Dr. Amato um, published, I believe it was 2015, 16, and just want to throw in there, you know, we actually collected data on driving pressure at University of Maryland Shock Trauma Center on 200 patients, and we had a significant less, oops, we had a significantly less uh, driving pressure in APRB versus our pressure control patients, 10.65 versus 13.37, uh, and volume control fell in the middle, about 12.36. I was not really focusing on mortality rates, but I went back and looked and it actually APRV did have a lower mortality rate. Um, so these were a couple of abstracts we published in the American Thoracic Society a couple of years ago. Another one that we did, one of my favorites, lung recruitment de decreases driving pressure, not the clinician. So many focus on driving pressure and making ventilator changes to bring your driver pressure less than 15. That's been a dis big discussion with a lot of therapists as well with setting T low. So we recommend as we get to T low to setting it to maintain 75% of the peak expiratory flow rate. Here's a patient. We did not make vent changes to bring our driving pressure less than 18. So this patient came in for a, a ECMO, did not patient um, it was a Jehovah witness. The family didn't want to put him on, on ECMO because he will need blood products. This patient then was converted to APRV and they start proning him. On the using APRV TCAP method, his initial driving pressure was 18. We didn't make changes. We felt our settings were appropriate. And since we, our settings were appropriate, his driving pressure decreased the next day to 15 and then to 11. So this is showing us that our vent strategy was working and driving pressure was decreasing. So we're kind of think, thinking of more using it as a, a good way to trend if your vent strategies is working. If the number was increasing, then we would question our vent strategies and have to rethink things. But he was actually 
driving pressure was decreasing. And from day 11, from the time he was admitted to our hospital for ECMO, he was extubated in 11 days. And he here came for ECMO. So again, I really urge facilities to try to use APRB TCAV before we just cannulate patients. You know, why do such an invasive procedure? Why don't you could go over to your vent and switch the mode? I think we at least should try, uh, try the mode before cannulating patients. So again, driving pressures, consider plateau pressure minus PEEP or auto PEEP. And in APRB, it's P high minus the total, uh, the, 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 the time constant PEEP we're creating equals your driving pressure. And I will tell you, looking at 200 patients, this really, really showed me how important T low has to be set correctly. You have to be setting that correctly or you will have a high driving pressure. And we'll get to that. So T high is the time we're spending inspiration. We usually say, you know, in adults, we want to and at least 90% of that high CPAP level. In if neonates and peds, because they have less surface area, you're going to be spending less time at that, more like to 80, 85. So again, think about the IU ratio in conventional modes, one to four, you might get to two to one, uh, three to one, four to one. But for those that say, well, APRV, if a patient's not spontaneously breathing, it's just like pressure control inverse ratio. So you get to a nine to one IE ratio, and that's what we think about. It. If you want to think of it that way, that's what we're doing in APRV. So you can achieve a lot longer inspiratory times than you can in your tr traditional modes. So, you, so if someone says that, I, I totally disagree with them. APRV is not equal to inverse pressure control because the times we spend on inspiration, the higher means we can achieve, and we're creating PEEP based on what the patient needs versus a, a table. So here's the formula for those that want to calculate how much time you're spending in um, at that high CPAP level. T high divided by your total times times 100 will give you that a percentage. Should be 90%. But uh, I mean, we'll run, run through an example of one how to calculate it. T high of four seconds, T low of 0.6. Uh, so four divided by 4.6 gives me 87% that I'm spending 87% in this example at that high CPAP level. And here's a different example, 5.5 in a TLO 0.5. And this is a lot of times our starting settings in, in patients with um, right in starting APRV from the time of intubation or someone that has a, a, a normal pH and CO2. Uh, this is a, these are pretty good settings to start out with is my T high and TLO. And that's giving me not almost 92% at the high CPAP level. So the advantage of using such long inspiratory times as you could Remember, we all learned about the pores of calm pathway that, you know, especially with patients with that, a lot of atelectasis, it will start getting, we spend more time in inspiration, we'll start recruiting as you're, these arrows are pointing to the alveoli we're actually recruiting. And in, in anesthesiologists have also figured this out. This is looking at the, the atelectasis uh, versus doing it um, time after starting a, a, a um, if all the capacity maneuver, recruitment maneuvers to do in the operating rooms, and you know, around, around five seconds, you're seeing a, a decrease in that electasis. So, I want to talk about different T high settings. So, here's one of the ex uh, examples. This is actually one of my uh, traumatic brain injury patients that we uh, wanted to switch over to APRV. He was on SIMV gas 745-35150 on a rate of 25, tidal volume was 550, PEEP of 14, and the physician felt like you can't put someone on APRV with a rate of 25 and he's a TBI patient and you need a, a lower CO2. So it, it just happened that day. I was lucky. I had Dr. Habashi as my attending to let me transition the patient over. So due to the fact this was a traumatic brain injury, we say the range is usually four to six. I decided to be more conservative. So I went with a T high of four that gives me 13 breaths per minute or 13 releases. So I used the same plateau pressure for this patient. Um, so I took PI of 26 over zero, TLO was 0.55. This was the 4 a.m. gas. This is my 4 p.m. gas. I had no problems ventilating this patient. And my PF ratio went from 272 to 395. So how can I do this? How can I still ventilate a patient with not needing to match the respiratory rate in this case? This patient had a normal pH and a normal CO2, so I don't need to match. 
alveolar um, match minute volume because I'm going to do more alveolar ventilation. Then I want to show you when when you should match the respiratory rate. And this is a common issue when patients are we're, we're trying to rescue with APRV and we're still trying to use a T high of four to six. So this is another abstract we published uh, actually in, in the Respiratory Care Journal a few years ago. This is a patient that was about to be cannulated. It's 6.30 in the morning. This was the 4.30 guys. The day shift therapist came on and said, give me one shot on APRB. They're like, you have one shot with the next ABG in an hour. If we don't see what we want, we're going to cannulate. So here's a, a patient already on a, a rate of 22. The pH is 7.09 CO2 61. If I went to a T high four to, four to six, giving me 10, 11 breaths per minute, is that going to work? No, it, it's going to fail. And that's where we're going to, oh, APRB didn't work. When you're rescuing a patient and they're acidotic, no matter if it's related to CO2, if it's bicarb combination, usually it's a combination, match the respiratory rate. At this point right now, we need to bulk ventilate this patient. You're going to still achieve a nice high mean and pressure, a lot higher than you're able to achieve over uh, in your previous mode because of our strategies, able to spend more time in that inspiration. We're spending two seconds already in inspiration by matching the rate. That's going to give me a, 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 a pretty close to that respiratory rate. An hour later, the pH was 736.29. My PF ratio went from 72 to 223. So let's talk about these settings. And this is what uh, we really want to make sure everyone understands rescue settings with the T high. If you're acidotic, you should be matching the rate. So it's 60 seconds divided by breaths per minute equals your total time. So total time minus T low. We usually set our T low 0.5. So we start out there and then assess our patient. That's going to give you your T high. So in this example, 60 seconds divided by the rate of 22 is giving us a total time of 2.7. 2.7 minus 0 0.5 or T low or T high was 2.2. You would start there, assess your T low and make adjustments. So that's giving us a rate of 22 matching that rate. In this case, this was an experienced therapist. She she just went right to two, knowing that she needed to match the rate. The T-low the patient actually needed was 0.65. That gave her 23 breaths per minute. And that's how she got those awesome results. This has also been published uh, for you uh, to download on aprvnetwork.org. Just register and you can get uh, these protocols. So now let's talk about the importance of time low. Time low is the amount of time we're spending in expiration. It's usually anywhere from 0.3 to 0.6. You know, usually what we're finding on the V500 starting a 0.5 is a good place to start and then assess the waveform to trap 75%. Not everybody's going to need 0.5. So that's you have to assess the waveform. It could be 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. We'll, we'll talk about that. So also need to pay attention to the angle of this deceleration. It's an important aspect of the flow curve. It gives you a lot of information what's going on with your patient. Again, we're setting our P low at zero, so there's no resistance when the patient's exhaling. So it could really see the, the true lung characteristics. So normally we should be seeing a, a nice angle of deceleration as you're seeing here. I, this is where I want you guys to pay attention to. That peak expiratory flow rate you're getting actually tells you a lot about your patient. So normally you will, you will see that be around 50 or 60. Someone with really stiff lungs, you're going to see that number get even bigger. It's going to be a more negative number, negative 80, uh, negative 100. I've seen with someone really, those stiff lungs, they just, once you release the pressure, they just want to uh, close up. An obstructive patient, you would see more like 20, I've seen all the way down to 20, you'll see you know, 30 to 40, that peak expiratory flow rate. And you the, you see that angle being greater than 45. I've walked into the room in the OR where they're trying to ventilate the patient on APRB, they had issues ventilating. The first thing I noticed is peak expiratory flow rate was 20. I had to stretch out his T low, and he was an obstructed patient. So the patient's telling me, the waveform's telling me about this patient's lung. To, then that's the only time we maintain 25 to 50 percent of the peak expiratory flow rate. All of a sudden, the patient's now able to ventilate. So pay attention to that number. So yes, it's been uh, you know, we used to say 50 to 75. We've really learned at bedside and studies that Dr. Habashi and Gary Neiman have done in the lab. The 75 percent is the best 
to set your, your peak expiratory flow rate. So in comparing T low, setting at 75, and if you set it incorrectly in this example being 10%, and then also looking at PEEP of 16 and 5, the top being inspiration, the bottom being expiration. They've colored uh, the alveoli yellow so they can really stick out for you. But if you're setting a T, uh, let's look at the APRB first, a T low at 75%, you see our alveoli look pretty much the same in uh, inspiration and expiration. If you set T low inappropriately, you're seeing a lot of the alveoli closing during expiration. Same thing with PEEP. If you're using enough PEEP, you could... You're seeing less decrease in the alveoli closing, not using enough PEEP. You're going to uh, be having a lot of alveoli opening and closing, and you're worried about lung strain um, to, the, to the lungs. So, again, one of my big uh, things that I like about IPRB because we're not playing the guessing game of how much PEEP I'm get, I want to use. You know, many of us of our clinic providers don't want to use high PEEPs. So, I think in APRB, you don't see how much people you're using unless you're doing the expiratory hold, you're setting it to what your patient needs. So this is where you could cause a lot of micro strain and macro strain on the on the lungs, on the alveoli. So the, the minimum you, strains you see is with the APRV at T low of 75%, the higher PEEP levels, you see more increase in the strains with the lower PEEPs and the T low set inappropriately. So setting the T low. So this, when we see peak expiratory flow rate, is the, the first, the peak expiratory flow right here. We're going to freeze the screen and actually measure that. That's peak expiratory flow. Termination expiratory flow rate is the end of the expiration. And that should be 75% of your peak expiratory flow rate. And that, and the, whatever we retain in there is the expiratory lung volume. So we're not exhaling the baseline like we would normally do in the traditional mode. We basically want to create auto peep. So let's say in this example, we're seeing negative 60, negative 80 is our peak expiratory flow rate. Right? So 60 divided by 80 times 100 is actually how it gives you your formula how to calculate how much you're trapping. All right, so 60 divided by 80 times 100 gets your percentage. Another way of calculating out, let's say you're just putting someone on, my peak expiratory flow rate is negative 57.4, and I know I want to maintain 75%. So 54 times 0.75 is going to give me a termination expiratory flow rate at 43. So I know I want my termination expiratory flow rate to be 43, and that's just another way of doing it. So that's my, when you're freezing the screen on the V500, you want to get, capture the largest number on the peak expiratory flow rate right there where my cursor is. Then you keep moving it to the right and look at the numbers we're he seeing here on our flow over, this is flow over time. So right now it's 45, 44. So you want to capture the, the largest number at the end, right at the corner there. When you see the number really change, 44 to 35, uh, like how Jeff describes this, you're basically falling off the cliff at that point. You've gone too far. So you're going to move back your cursor to the right where I was getting the 44, 45 right at that corner. The 44 here divided by 57 times 100, I'm maintaining 77% of my peak expiratory flow rate. So here's a patient that has ARDS, a lot of atelectasis. What our T low is set. Am I trapping? Am I maintaining 75%? No, I'm not. You can see I'm maybe trapping only 25%. So how do I fix this? And my angle is less than 45. I'm going to shorten my TLO. So if I calculate this out, and with experience, you don't need to calculate it out because I can look at it. I'm not even trapping 50%. So shorten your TLO to get to, to trap, maintain 75%. Here's an obstructive patient. You can see my peak expiratory flow rate, maybe uh, 50 here, and my uh, end expiration looks like 40. My uh, The angle here uh, is greater than 45, starting to look more square. What do we need to do? You need to stretch that out. So a patient that has obstructive lung disease, if you see that, another clue is going to tell you something's wrong with your TLO. Look at how they're breathing. You know, back in the days, we didn't have all these waveforms on our events. Take the sheet off the, the patient. Look at the patient. If they're forcing to exhale, something's wrong with your, your settings. They're forcing to exhale. 
you know, look at your peak expiratory flow rate, assess your patient. Do I need to stretch out that, that T low? And I've seen this not just on APRV. I've seen with patients with high peeps, obstructive patients that are forcing the exhale. You got to assess your patient, look at the patient and, and uh, consider your settings. So I don't like when therapists just go in and look at the T low without anything else. Oh, it looks square. As you guys can see, this looks square right now. And they just want to go stretch it out. Assess your patient. Why, if you had the nice ankle earlier and now it's gone, why is it gone? It could be any kind of um, secretions in the circuit. Is a secretions in the, if you're using HMEs, uh, it's looking square and kind of jaggedy in there. This patient needs to be suctioned out. It also can change too. Any increased resistance uh, when we're using a lot of bacterial filters, especially now with COVID, we're putting uh, filters on everyone. We forget to change them or we're running some type of um, medication uh, and they needs to be changed a little bit more frequently. It could also affect your waveform. So first assess your patient before just stretching out the T low. And as you pay attention to waveforms, you're going to learn a lot about your patient. So here you up. The first one looks like my patient needs to be suctioned out. The second one is a patient that had a beautiful waveform earlier, but all of a sudden it looks really squ square. And you can see not having a nice decelerating flow pattern with the beginning of each, um, each, each breath. The patient had a huge obstruction, something that we couldn't clear with suctioning end up needing to... Um, bron bronc the patient, H huge mucus plugs. So, and, and I have to say, when I went back to uh, shock trauma uh, as a supervisor, one of the first things Dr. Habashi said to me, you know, we weren't, we're not good at setting our T low. So I highly suggest make it part of your event assessment. And that's how it is at University of Maryland. It's T divided by P, termination divided by peak expiratory flow rate percentage is part of the ventilator assessment. And that's really making everyone pay attention to that. And then you're uh, able to assess these waveforms and understand what's going on with your patient. So those waveforms, is, is your patient telling you what's going on? So you also, I just want to point out, as the waveforms can change uh, for a patient maybe getting obstructive, uh, maybe do recruiting, all of a sudden now they're not trapping enough, and now you need to trap more, that's the signs of de-recruitment. But also, as they recruit, the waveform will also change, start looking more square. So it's it's the waveform telling you something. So it's really important we, we are assessing that. The draggers do also have another uh, feature where you can set auto-release. Basically, the vet will uh, uh, adjust the TILO to maintain the percentage you're dialing in. And in this one, we did 75%. Like I said, the obstructive patients, you'll do more 25 to 50. And I include the spinal cord injury patients in there because they end up acting like asthmatic patients. So the T low max is what you set the maximum you allow it to, to change. I think it's real important as RTs that we understand the, the T low setting. And if the ventilator is making huge changes in T low, I think it's important that we know. And I, and I think it's sometimes I think it's better we make the changes versus the ventilator. Uh, because if you're making a huge T low change, you might need to be making a, a, a P high change as well. So pay attention to that as well. So that's the auto release on APRV. So as we're also um, talk, talk a little bit about weeding before I get into the case studies. So what we do to wean patients really from the time of intubation, 24 hours once they are in the ICU, we try to start to see can the patient spontaneously breathe? Can Because it's important to not allow diaphragm atrophy to kick in start seeing if the patient can spontaneously breathe adequately. So we will stretch the T-high out um, at another 10 seconds to us. So usually, like we said, we're, we're at five on patients that are uh, using APRV from time of intubation. Add five, 10 to us, so that's 15. And then we look at the percentage minute volume spontaneous, great feature to have on the ventilator, and see how much of the minute volume is the patient able to maintain. Then are you seeing a nice normal respiratory rate, a nice rhythmic respiratory rate, and, and looking if those uh, spontaneous uh, breaths look good. So yeah, this patient looks good. So why not let them use a, a diaphragm, stretch out the T high, maybe they still need the P high of 25, and that's okay. When the patient's telling you you can wean the P high, that's when we wean P high. We are not going to wean the P high based on the ABG. Oh my gosh, the PO2 is 200. He still has a lot of atelectasis. He's still going to the organ and get a lot of fluid. Do I want my wean my P high? Unless my diaphragm is flat, 
I won't rush to it if my patient has high FiO2s. But let's not forget, we're not stuck at 40%. Our vents could go, or FiO2 could go below 40. Um, we just need to get a little better about that. So weaning, yes, try to get the patient to use their, di their diaphragm to prevent diaphragm atrophy, stretch out the T high. We well, won't go out to 30 seconds. You're closer than the CPAP, basically, with those patients. As long as they're not, uh, have a lot of increased work of breathing, they can handle that workload. Uh, and and I, if you see them wor working hard, uh, I like the P01 on the ventilator and to assess the patient's workload, uh, neurologic drive to breathe. And if you're seeing high numbers, up, oh, the patient is not ready for the workload you've given them. Maybe they're still septic and, and have high CO2 production and they still need help with ventilation. In the PHI, pay attention to what's going on the x-ray, AB, ABG, what's going on with the patient. If they're not go they're done with the OR, we're going to, uh, uh, patients were getting all this fluid off, we can start, we you know, weaning the PHI. Um, you know, again, with the COVID patients, what has uh, we've seen, they end up recruiting kind of fast and you have to keep up with them. And you see their diaphragm gets flat or, you know, we don't get x-rays in every couple hours. But if you start seeing them forcing to exhale, your waveform's turning square. Yeah, it's time to wean the P high. That's just looking at the nice rhythmic breathing I was talking about. A couple case studies I'll run through. Here's a patient, again, being in shock trauma, MVC with, that was injected, blunt chest and abdominal trauma, emergency exploratory lab, went to the OR. He was placed supine and flat with an open abdomen. He was in, in the OR on SINV. Upstairs, uh, so he was SINV pressure support, a rate of 12, tidal volume 600, 10 a peep, and he was spontaneously breathing. His gas was 742, 45, 47, though. Uh, SATs of 86. So coming up to the trauma units, we're going to place this patient on APRV. So our gas, so looking at our gas, we have a, a normal pH, CO2. This is the patient's x-ray. So we do see some pulmonary contusions. And let's talk about transitioning this patient. So here's your patient. Uh, we see that he's on a VCSIMV. Actually, uh, the ATC was also on. Uh, we have a PIP of 38, our inspiratory hold, let's see if I, EIP and inspiration pressure is 30. So going over to APRV, since his plateau was 30, we're going to go with 30 over zero. He had a normal pH CO2. I'm going to use our normal TI, four to six. So these are great numbers, you know, starting out with 5.5 .5 or 5 and, and 0.55. So pretty easy, right? We all agree the 30 over 0, the 5.5, or so you could even start at 5, P low is at 0, P low 0.5, but then you have to assess the waveform. Verifying T low, as we said, we're going to freeze the screen, move the cursor to the end of expiration, move it to the end to the right, and capture that number and then calculate it out. So you can see here it went 41 to 31. So I, I, I fell off the uh, cliff. So I want to go back to that 41 and calculate that out. I think I'm stuck. Slope, so we're going to set it in zero. We want to maximize the time and inspiration. So with those settings, this patient's spending 91% at the high CPAP level. Once we come Convert this patient over, our gas is 738, 38, 135, our PF ratio tripled. Patient's looking good. We're using the same pressure. So post-transitioning 24 hours, you know, make, you know, you're always assessing as you transition, is the, is the patient uh, hemodynamically stable? You know, they're having good chest expansion. If they're spontaneously breathing, are the respiration smooth and even? The spontaneous rate, always assess, assess that as well. What's the patient's spontaneous tidal volumes? Uh, always assessing release volumes. We're in a pressure mode. So as the patient's compliance increases or decreases, your release volumes are going to give you that answer. If someone's volumes go from 700 to 400, that's a sign that there's you know, patient's compliance may drop. Something's changed. Assess your patient. Your minute volume may go from 7 to 4. Do you just walk away? No, you know, assess your patient. Even your physician's not giving you vent settings, any changes, you need to assess what's changing and discuss it and 
you know, assess and, and come up with a solution because you know your CO2 is going to climb. You don't need an ABG to tell you your patient's uh, CO2 is climbing. So those are the patient transitioning. So peaks went from 38 to 30, plateaus to 30. Look at the mean air pressure. So again, we can achieve such a higher mean air pressure in APRB than we can in conventional modes. And we didn't need to match the minute volume. And we and patient's minute volume is less. And we are, had no issues with ventilating this patient um, because we we're doing achieving more alveolar ventilation. We recruited more lung. And that's why our PO2 also improved. So that's a nice transition. So things to consider uh, before transitioning patients, um, well, as we're rescuing patients, I really urge everyone uh, to consider a PRB TCAB method before we're trying ECMO for any of our ARDS patients. Uh, I think we we the patient deserves this, the, that capability of you know, providing them a different mode versus putting two cannulas in them. Wean FiO2 to maintain SATs. You know, don't leave your FiO2, your SATs at 100. Wean your FiO2 so as you're making changes, you can see if your patient's SATs are improving, they're recruiting, or they decreasing. Assess X-ray before weaning PHIs. So still know is my patient still has more recruitment to recruit, to recruit at 24 or 0, I will leave them there. Add ATC. It's a great feature to decrease work of breathing. And as you're weaning your patient, you're going from basically APRV to CPAP with releases. And as you're weaning, you're doing CPAP with ATC. Encouraging stretch the stretch test. That's by adding uh, 10 seconds T high to see if your patient can adequately spontaneously breathe. Utilize a non-compliant circuit when you're starting into really patients with high P highs, real stiff lungs, and you're seeing the big spikes during uh, exhalation on the peak expiratory flow rate. Uh, we don't measure the spikes on the peak expiratory flow rate. Uh, and and uh, you want to measure after the spike. Consider the non-compliant tubing. You know, when you think about that, um, also know, the, does the patient need active humidification? Can I get away with an HME? If they have a lot of chest tube leaks, I will probably stay on the active humidification because you don't want to have plugs issues later. Frequently assessing the expiratory flow pattern, I highly suggest that it's it's part of the mode. You need to know where your uh, TLO is set, maintaining 75%. And consider different positions for these patients. Uh, reverse T-Berg, patients with large abdomens to you know, get that big belly off their chest to help ventilate. Uh, consider if patient has maybe more collapse on the one side versus the other. Doing positional therapy, get the bad side up. I, and leave them up there for a while and try to recruit that lung. Just wanted to throw out some one article that was just published last year. It was a meta uh, a meta analysis and systematic review looking at APRV and the mortality benefit uh, in it with AP, APRV and uh, and is also showing improved oxygenation compared to conventional ventilation. So there are so many articles out there that showing that APRV is not works what we've learned in the lab, but also, and there's several others that, you know, due to the time constraints, you know, doing an, a lecture an hour that I could go over that I've done in other lectures that's shown APRV can make a difference with ARDS, sorry, for ARDS patients, for our patients that are ARDS ready to cannulate. Um, and there's so many cases now I'm hearing about how APRV can also make a difference with our patients on ECMO and helping us recruiting those patients. So real quick, I just threw a couple of slides here at the end. Uh, T high, uh, just because I've seen this, uh, the PI with some of my therapists um, that work a lot of ARDSnet units, don't wean the PI based on the mLs per kilogram per ideal body weight. Again, it's a pressure mode. It's going to tell you what's going on with the patient uh, as they in, in, uh, recruit the compliance changes, so your volumes. But in APRV especially, we do think and this is a slide that Dr. Habashi helped me put together. These are pig lungs from the lab. This is one that was in uh, used ARDSnet strategy. This is the one used in APRV. Let's say they weigh the same, but you can see this one's all red and inflamed, probably has a lot of co uh, collapse, and we just made these numbers up. So surface area, let's say you only have 50 alveoli, but the, the pig weighs 70 kilograms, 6 mLs per kilogram. That's a total volume 420. So each alveoli is going to see 8.4 mLs. Here's one that weighs the same, but and we're seeing 700 mLs tidal volumes. That's 10 mLs per kilogram. But 
we have a lot more alveoli contributing to ventilation. So, so let's say we have 500, only each one seeing 0.71 of volume versus the 8.4. Which one do you actually think I'm causing lung injury? I would say the one with the 8.4. So just throwing that out there, something to think about more um, when you're looking at those large release volumes, especially with lungs that you have completely recruited, you have more alveoli contributing to ventilation. So I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, I'm open to any, oops, I skipped around, uh, to any questions. I really appreciate all of you for joining us, even um, the change in, in time. And I will open it up to questions.